Good morning, and welcome to Shield of Faith. This broadcast is coming to you from St. Andrew's Church, a traditional Anglican parish of the Reformed Episcopal Church in Tinley Park, Illinois. We believe salvation is by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that the Bible is the authoritative Word of God. The Scriptures tell us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, to take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. We are glad you chose to be with us, and our hope is that you will be blessed and strengthened through the hearing of God's holy word. So we invite you to come, listen, and learn that the power and the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ is real for you today. His is the power to change lives. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our pastor, the Reverend Frank Levi. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the 50th chapter of the book of Genesis, we read about the death of Jacob and some of the aftermath of his death, the uh, situation between Joseph and his brothers that arose after the death of their father. I'd like to begin reading with the 15th verse of the 50th chapter. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Forgive, I pray you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now we pray you, Forgive the transgression of the servants of God. Joseph wept when they spoke this to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Thus he reassured them and comforted them. Joseph, I believe, is truly one of the most remarkable and admirable people that we find anywhere in the scriptures. It seems that not one bad thing is said about Joseph. He was the favorite son of his father Jacob, but he was hated by his brothers. They were jealous of him. Uh, I suppose jealous because uh, Jacob loved Joseph so much, but probably also uh, disliked him because he was so honest, certainly much more honest than they were. And so one day when they were out in the fields far from anyone else, they decided that they would do something about this Joseph. First they thought that they would kill him. Uh, but then they decided they'd make some money out of it. So they sold him into slavery. He became a slave in Egypt, shipped down into Egypt, and was purchased by a man named Potiphar. He found himself there in Potiphar's house uh, doing various tasks, and he did them so well that Potiphar elevated him to be in charge of all of his other servants, in charge of his entire household, and everything seemed to be going quite well for Joseph, or at least for a while. That is, until uh, Potiphar's wife cast her gaze upon him. She apparently was a very lustful woman, and she tried to persuade him to have a sexual affair with her, which he, of course, refused. He said, I can't do this. It's not right. I cannot sin against God and sin against your husband either. And so she makes up a story that Joseph tried to rape her, to molest her, and Potiphar has him thrown into prison. And there in prison, he had certain tasks, certain duties, and the warden of the prison realized that, hey, this Joseph... Is a very talented young man. And so again, he was elevated, became uh, somewhat in charge of the rest of the prisoners and so forth. And one day, uh, two prisoners, a butler and a baker, uh, were thrown into prison. Uh, the butler happened to be the butler of Pharaoh, and so was the baker. And they had dreams, and Joseph was able to interpret their dreams. Uh, the baker was hanged. Uh, the butler, however, was released. He was sent back to his duties with Pharaoh. And there, in Pharaoh's house, instead of remembering the request of Joseph that he would tell Pharaoh about him, 
he completely forgot. And so for two more years, Joseph languished there in prison. But one night, Pharaoh had a dream. Pharaoh dreamed that there were uh, sheaves of wheat that were beautiful, lovely, seven of them. Uh, these then were followed by seven that uh, were you know, scrawny, blighted, devouring the seven good ones. And that dream was doubled. Uh, there were cows, sleek, beautiful, well-fed, followed by seven that were gaunt, half-starved to death. And it was then that the butler remembered that there was a young man in prison who could interpret dreams, uh, Joseph by name. And so Joseph was brought before Pharaoh. He interpreted the dream, going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of very severe famine. And so Pharaoh very wisely decided, this is a young man who should be put in charge of gathering up all of the grain that he can for those seven bountiful years so that we might have enough food for the seven years of famine. And so at the age of 30, Joseph became what would really amount to the prime minister of Egypt. Egypt at that time, of course, was the most powerful nation on earth. And there... He gathered the food for the seven bountiful years. And during the years of famine, he began to distribute the food. His family back in Palestine, they were suffering from the famine. And eventually they came down into Egypt and were reunited with Joseph. He was 39 years old at that time. Sold into slavery at 17. Became a slave, a prisoner eventually. And then finally, the prime minister of all of Egypt and 39 united again with his own family. That brings us to the text that we read a few moments ago. His father Jacob has died, and now his brothers are sure that Joseph is going to repay them for what they had done to him so many years before. Now in these varied circumstances of life, Joseph could have reacted differently than he did. He could have become discouraged, depressed, given into despair, thrown up his hands and simply given up. Or he could have become angry. He could have fed that anger until it turned into resentment and a desire for revenge, just waiting until he had the opportunity to do to his brothers what they had done to him. Or he could have reacted with lust, physical lust. He could have given in to the temptations of Potiphar's wife. But again, he did not do that. Or there was the lust for power lust for fame. He was raised to a very high position in the most powerful nation on earth at that time, and so there was that temptation as well. But Joseph did not give in to any of those things, not to discouragement, not to anger or the desire for revenge, uh, nor to lust for physical gratification or for wealth or for fame. Joseph responded to the various circumstances of his life as he did because in every situation, Joseph saw the hand of God. Abraham Kuyper spoke of those who have no eye for the presence of God's power in the ordinary course of things. People who are blind. People who do not see God working in the very ordinary, uh, the very mundane, the very routine things of life. And what a sad state those people are in, especially if those people are Christians. One of the truly wonderful and beautiful things about Joseph was that he did have the sort of eye that Kuiper was speaking about, an eye that could indeed see the presence of God even in the ordinary things of life and in even the tragedies and misfortunes of life. And that did indeed set him apart. That was one reason why God could use him efficiently. That's why he was a man that God placed in a position that he placed him in because he knew that he could trust Joseph to do what was right. Joseph's response to his brothers is a great statement on divine providence. Am I God? Am I in the place of God? What he's really saying, I believe there is a God, a God in heaven, who controls everything, a God who has controlled my life, Even uh, my uh, being sold into prison, uh, sold into slavery at the age of 17, the imprisonment and the false accusations, uh, and everything else. He is saying to his brothers, I believe that God is a God of providence. 
Now, what does that mean? What is divine providence? Theologians speak about that, so I decide, well, you know, I'll look this up. Uh, what do the theologians say? You know, what is a concise definition of divine providence? Well, I found one. It says that when we talk about divine providence, we're actually talking about, and here's the quotation, we're talking about how God conserves, cares for, and governs the world. Okay, it's very clear, very concise. Divine providence has to do with God conserving his creation. In Acts chapter 17, verse 25, St. Paul said, He giveth to all life, breath, and all things. God takes care of the world that he has made. He gives to all human beings and to all animals uh, life and breath, uh, all of the good things that we need to sustain life. He conserves his creation. He takes care of his creation. It also means that he cares for his creation. As Psalm 145 tells us, The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand, and satisfiest the desires of every living thing. God cares. God made this world because of love, because he wanted something that you know, he could uh, pour himself into. And he loves what he has made. What he made was good. And so he cares for it. We look to him. He opens his, his hand. He satisfies the desires of every living thing. It all comes from God. And then there is God governing his creation. God rules over the affairs of men and nations. He directs men consciously or sometimes unconsciously. He permits or he prevents the occurrence of events. Uh, he determines the limitations of all things. Uh, nations rise, nations fall. People come into power, or people lose their power. God is the one who is in control. So divine providence does indeed speak about God conserving God caring for, and God governing his creation. And that certainly is the Christian view of divine providence. However, if we leave it there, uh, we do indeed have a very nice uh, theological explanation. But we need more than that, don't we? What exactly does that mean in my day-to-day -day life? How do I apply this? Uh, and that's something we always have to do. We need to take our doctrines... And we need to actually apply those doctrines. Uh, we need to take what the Bible says, um, even stories like the story about Joseph, and we need to not only know the content of the Scripture, the principles, but we need to then take that and apply it to our lives. You know, this is what it means, but this is how my life should change, you know, the application of it. So we have here the story about Joseph. Joseph, who believed in divine providence, who believed that God was in control of everything. But how did that change his life, and how should that change my life? If I truly believe that God is in control, that he is indeed conserving, uh, caring for, and governing everything, how should that change me? Now, if we do indeed apply the scriptural teaching regarding divine providence, I believe that's going to change our views in several very, very specific ways. Uh, to begin with, it should change our outlook on life in general. God's in control. God is the governor of everything. Joseph said, am I in the place of God? 